The following program is an MLWRadio.com production. The Ric Flair Show. My name is Ric Flair. Woo! Woo! To be the man, you got to beat the man. And I'm saying, woo, right here, I'm the man. The 16-time world champion. Woo! Back behind the mic and telling it like it is. Woo! If you're not carrying the big gold, you're second best no matter what you tell yourself. I'm the best. Y'all playing catch-up ball. To the Nature Boy. And now, your hosts of the Ric Flair Show, Ric Flair and Conrad Thompson. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Nature Boy, Ric Flair, the host of the Ric Flair Show, 16 times your world champion, along with my spectacular co host, owner of the Conradus, the estate, they call it in Alabama, the estate, okay? Sometimes known as the southeast version of the Mustang Ranch. At any rate, Conrad Thompson, wow. entrepreneur, multimillionaire, diversified life, conqueror of more women than the nature boy Ric Flair. <laughs> well, that's questionable. Anyway, welcome to the show, and uh, Conrad, I can't thank you enough, man. What a great gig we got today going on with Shawn Michaels, HBK. And to open the show up, I promised him I would say this before he came on the air. He is the greatest professional wrestler of all time. I had to bribe him. How's that? Well, I don't know. I might debate that he's uh, he's definitely top two. I'll give him that. He's top two. We don't say that now before we get him on the air. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we've got a jam-packed show. He's we've the greatest right now, okay? <laughs> oh, absolutely. We've wanted Sean on the show for a long, long time. We're glad to finally have him here. But but first, let's get into our top four figure four stories brought to you by the RicFlair.com online store. they got brand new items like koozies, bottle openers, hats, money clips, T-shirts, and more. Be sure to check out RicFlair.com and be sure to click the online store at the top of the page. All right, Rick, this week's figure four top stories brought to you by RicFlair.com. Let's go. The ESPYs. Carry us through it. You were interviewed at the desk right before on the countdown show. Was that your first time doing something like that? Yeah, I had never been to the ESPYs. It's been my favorite show for years. It was fabulous. Uh, and I knew so many of the athletes, uh, you know, from Shaq and Charles Barkley to Dr. J, Kareem, and then all the football players. Of course, all the Cavaliers were there. Um, I just had a superb time. Um, so honored. Uh, I was on uh, the sports show ESPN and got to talk a little bit about Brock and uh, his success um, and uh, you know, the crossover demographic of our of our sports with other athletes. So it was great. And I felt so honored to be there. And uh, John Cena, the band, uh, recognized me, and it was huge. So what can I say? My phone, i got to text a minute. The minute he said that, you texted me five times. <laughs> I will not use the verbiage you used, but it was such a like, what the... <laughs> well, yeah, it was great, man, and, and, and I'm surprised yeah. WWE didn't show it on Raw last night. It seems like anything WWE and the mainstream they normally push, but John Cena hit a home run. It was a great show, and, and I'm glad you got to go. I know it was a big deal. Yeah, it was fabulous, and I, I was, of course, the opportunity to be with my lovely daughter, Charlotte, was even cooler. Well, and Charlotte's in the news. Uh, let's go ahead and go to story number two. The champ is here! All right, so Charlotte passes Nikki's reign, and WWE doesn't mention it. And this is kind of curious to me, Rick. Nikki Bella's reign was 301 days, but this Monday on Raw, Charlotte would have been at 302 days. So after they made Nikki breaking AJ Lee's record such a big deal, why not mention it for Charlotte on Raw? You know, until you brought this up, I wasn't even aware of that. That's awesome. Uh, I was uh, just so thrilled that she was drafted so high. I mean, being the first woman drafted, as you acknowledged on uh, on um, a text to me, and then of course we put out on Twitter and uh, that uh, she was, uh, you know, number three chosen overall, and uh, and I thought it was fabulous. I mean, it speaks volumes for the respect that she has built amongst her peers. 
Yeah, just a main year on the roster and uh, the number three pick overall, the first woman picked, and now the longest reigning champion in WWE history. So, uh, for the female side, of course, big, big deal. But you mentioned it. Let's go to story number three, the draft. With the first pick in the 2016 draft. What would you think, Rick? The draft was last night, first episode of SmackDown Live. Were you pleased with the way everything shook out? Did it go kind of how you imagined? Yeah, I thought it was great, and I thought... uh... Um, you know, it was, uh, you know, it's well orchestrated. I mean, uh, you, you feel a little bit of the, you know, even though it's not real, you, you feel like there's a little tension between uh, uh, Shane and Stephanie, but there really isn't. I mean, but it comes across like that. And uh, Mick Foley did a hell of a job. And uh, Daniel Bryan, I mean, uh, if I was going to do one thing different, I wouldn't be going, yes, 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 for everybody comes out. <laughs> do you think it takes away from everybody else for them to be doing the yes, yes, yes? Well, it would be like if I was the host and every time somebody walked out, I went woo, woo, woo. I mean, what would you do, right? The idea, I think, is to um, feature the individual you're drafting uh, uh, as much as possible. I get the excitement that it comes with that, but I think that you just got to be careful that it's not overdone. Hey, so hypothetically, lots of questions about uh, the dynamic between a babyface Mick Foley and a heel Stephanie McMahon. Hypothetically, if they had picked a heel instead of Mick Foley, who would have been a good heel to pair with Stephanie? Me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so then you could have had yes, yes, yes on one side and woo, woo, woo on the other. Woo on the other. No, I don't know. Um, Let me think. Um that's retired right now. I don't know. I mean, you know, she is so strong uh, that it, it would take someone that can really talk to hang in there with her. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Mick, Mick definitely is not a heel. He's uh, going to be, uh, he has worked that way, but he's loved and respected, you know, as being a good guy, which he is. And, uh, you know, the spectacular stunts that he performed over the years which have left him just barely able to walk around. But he's, it hasn't certainly uh, uh, hurt his wit or his charm. So I'm happy for him. Let's get to story number four. Uh, this is maybe some mainstream news this week. I'm sure you've seen it everywhere. Uh, 50 wrestlers are suing the WWE for brain injuries, including CTE. Uh, they released the list. Have you had a chance to look at the list? And what are your thoughts on the I have. Lawsuit? I have. Any surprises on there to you? Uh, well, first of all, um, I think it's uh, unrealistic. I feel bad, uh, and I'm, I'm saying this out loud. I feel bad for the guys that are doing this because um, um, we've all put ourselves on the line. It's what we did for a living. You know, nobody nobody twisted our arms. Does that make sense? So it's yeah. something that we did, and it's something that. Uh, happens and uh, I just think that you know sometimes hard times can cause you to make bad decisions and uh, I just feel bad that they're giving the company this kind of PR I don't think it's I don't think it's good for, for the image of the company and I don't think it's good personally for the image of the individuals doing it so do you think that there will be um any sort of settlement on this? I mean, it seems like WWE's been batting a thousand in terms of getting rid of these uh, these lawsuits. I, you... you know what? I have no idea. I, that's I don't know that the uh, the thing that I think pushes the buttons for everybody. Is they see these settlements being made by the NFL, um, and I, but I don't know. I don't know enough about it, and don't even feel comfortable commenting because I don't know. I just I feel bad that the company is getting. That kind of exposure. I actually saw it on Sports Center yesterday, which shocked me. I didn't realize it was that big a deal. Um, you know, p- people have taken shots at the WWE for years and, uh, and, and end up with zero. So um, I, I don't have any idea. You know, one of the things that shocked me is some of the names I, I, on the list. I know this right now. I'm feeling very lightheaded. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have a remedy for that. I yeah, s- listen, if anybody. <laughs> If anybody's walking around with some battle scars, it's like I got a hell of a memory, but n- nothing else works. <laughs> <laughs> well, whoa, 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 wait, wait, sorry, sorry, I said that. You know my new thought. You know my new saying, right? What's that? Boys say, what is it, Wendy? Yeah, boys say, um, 
Oh, God. No memory trouble in WWE. Got it. No, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the boys say, when's he going to leave? The women say, God, I hope he comes back soon. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about that for a minute. The boys say, God, I hope he leaves. And the women say, God, I hope he comes back soon. Woo! <laughs> the seven-year ache, baby. <laughs> All right, let's go into In Wendy's o- case, it's a 23-year ache. <laughs> Uh, we're going to get to her. Let's go into overtime now. Story number five. All right, so Brock Lesnar fails his UFC drug test. Last week we talk about how dominant a performance it was. This week we all get a little bit of a surprise. Uh, he was popped by USADA testing, and USADA testing is completely different from every other type of testing. So lots of folks kind of jump to conclusions about what it would be. Uh, as we're talking now on Wednesday morning, it's just come out yesterday that it was an estrogen blocker that he was tested for. Uh, Rick, explain to us commoners, us common folks, uh, why would someone be taking an estrogen blocker? You know, this is something I'm, I'm going to be as out front and tell you about. I don't know enough about that stuff either. <laughs> so I don't want to make a comment. But I can tell you this, uh, after watching that, I don't care what anybody was on. Brock Nessler dominated him. There's nothing, I mean, it's like people talking about PEDs with baseball players, right? I promise you, they do not help hand-eye coordination. If you hit the ball, it might go farther, (laughs) but there's nothing that you can put in a needle and inject in your body that's going to make your hand-eye coordination. I could take steroids for 150 years and not hit a 100-mile fastball. How about you? Uh, yeah, there's no chance I'm hitting that. Yeah, I, I mean, the Clayton Kershaw, I I watch those pitches come across the plate. I can't even see them going, and I, my eyesight is still good. <laughs> so I just, I, mean, I think that stuff's overrated. I, I, I think that in, 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 if anything, in over the years, it, it, it was used, uh, PEDs were used more for um, appearance sakes. And God knows I have some huge cosmetic issues. You know, I should have been on it forever. But I can tell you this, this this, this in no way, shape, or form makes Brock less of a star. Does that make sense? Absolutely. No, I totally agree. I mean, he, he's a huge, a huge player that, I mean, what he did after five years, and once again, I don't care what they're trying to say he took or didn't take after five years off, to get back in shape and dominate like that. And uh, I've never met Mark Hunt, but I, I don't think he was in shape. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was just, that was so so clearly, I mean, I, a lot of people thought it was going to be so one-sided for Mark, but, I mean, Brock, he, Brock was on a mission to prove something, and he did. All right, let's get to our last top story here, and this is one I've been looking forward to. So, Rick, uh, I thought we talked last week, or maybe it was a couple of weeks ago, and you said your goal was to stay off of TMZ. But you were back on TMZ again this week. They say the Nature Boy is going to walk that aisle one more time. What's the deal, man? Are you getting married again? Oh, well, listen, I'm engaged, okay? Say, Romeo, what about your promise to the He-Man Woman Haters Club? The marriage is, you know, that's that's under... uh, I just had to really make a statement because she is that wonderful a person and uh, has really become not only my best friend, but, uh, you know, my lover of all time. Um, so I feel like by making a statement, I can hold off the walk down the aisle. <laughs> so this is hush <laughs> For a money. While. This is hush money. <laughs> but listen, she's blinged out, man. <laughs> oh, no, I saw. She, she walks around with her hand in the air. <laughs> Hello, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you're gonna yeah, get no, me. she's really happy, and her kids are happy, and I'm happy, and I'm, I've never been happier in my life. So that's the important thing, and uh, she certainly deserves anything that uh, that she wants. She's been so helpful in putting my life back together on a personal basis. So whatever the Wendy Rue wants. Um, I mean, she's the one that wrote that song, you know. All the boys hope they leave, and I, God, I hope he comes back soon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, all of our casual podcast listeners. She was thinking that this morning, just after last night. <laughs> okay. So you already got your cardio in today. Yeah, I got my cardio, yeah. 
<laughs> the uh, maybe maybe some listeners aren't longtime listeners. Uh, Wendy was once upon a time involved in the wrestling business. Tell everybody how you met Wendy. Well, it's funny. We were at center stage, and uh, we're all sitting there killing time, waiting for the show to start. And I see this guy, his name is Chip Burnham, bringing this beautiful girl down the stairs into center stage. And so I go to so I go to Chip Burnham. I said, he, and he, he walked around to Dusty's office. And I go, Chip, who the hell is that? He said, uh, some girl that wants to be a ballet work wrestler. I said, you got to be kidding me. I said, what's she doing now? I said, she's just a school teacher. So, you know, <laughs> it took me about six seconds to get to Dusty's office. And I said, man, we've never met before. My name's Rick Flair. I'm the world champion. And if you want to be a valet, Dusty, please make it happen. <laughs> 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 the rest is history. <laughs> Well, and uh, another one's down uh, in the books, I guess. This is going to be number five. So um, congratulations, Rick and Wendy. And you, you'll Well, be- listen, you'll be the best man when it happens. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I'm, I, I'm actually hoping you'll pay for the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> hell, we'll have it at the Conrad's and we'll fly everybody in. What the hell? Uh, you know, there are worse she places She loves the do. view of the cliff out of your place. So what better place to have it? We can have, what, five, 600 people there, right? I don't see why not. Come on. <laughs> You've got that many there before. <laughs> uh, yeah, on on national championship night, there have been that many here, but maybe not for a wedding. But there's a first time for everything, or a fifth yeah. time for everything. Yeah, it, it was, and we can we can all wear robes, my my wrestling robes. Okay, I'm in. As long as all the groomsmen <laughs> and, and and bridesmaids are wearing robes, this will be the coolest wedding yeah, ever. Yeah, bridesmaids too. <laughs> All right, so on the other side here, that concludes our figure four top stories. But on the other side of this break, we have the maybe greatest wrestler of all time? The greatest of all time. I concede that. I I like to say the best entering performer of all time, but um, I will give him the greatest wrestler of all time because he's that special a guy. I think that much of him personally, and uh, he's hard to track down, and the fact that he's taken time to uh, do the show with us, uh, it meant a lot to me, and he he's just a great guy, so I'm really looking forward to it. On the other side of the break, the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels. Five times! Woo! Don't you dare go away. Woo! Woo! You're listening to The Ric Flair Show. I can't help it that I look good, smell good, woo, can't dance all night long. I can't help that I'm the greatest wrestler alive today. The Ric Flair Show. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be the heavyweight champion of the world? We well, don't have to wonder anymore. Thanks to DaveMillikanBelts.com. We've got Dave with us today. And Dave, you've made belts for everybody, isn't that right? Lip sync battle, WWE. If, well, I'm where the pros go. Absolutely. Here's the thing. If you've seen it on TV, odds are pretty good that Dave Milliken made it. So don't just get a $400 replica. Get one like the pros wear. And all you've got to do is go to that site. What is it again, Dave? DaveMillikanBelts.com. MLWRadio.com is the place to go to binge on wrestling podcasts from the experts. Those who've been in the business at its highest levels. Also those with razor sharp insight and stories that you can only get at MLW Radio Network. This week. Actor and former WWE creative team member Freddie Prince Jr. talks about his time in WWE and even drops some Star Wars Rebel spoilers on the VIP Lounge with VIP and Greenie. Pro wrestling and MMA executive Court Bauer and Mr. St. Laurent break down the 2016 WWE draft and discuss a backstage throwdown, the New Japan GI Climax, and an NXT star at a crossroads. All on the network's flagship show, MLW Radio. Then tomorrow, the Jim Cornette experience goes uncut and uncensored as only the Louisville Slugger can. Plus, much, much more. Subscribe to these shows for free. The world of MLW Radio never stops. Go to MLWRadio.com and binge on pro wrestling talk from the experts now. Goodness gracious, quit balls of fire. Woo! The Ric Flair Show. Don't miss a minute of The Ric Flair Show. Subscribe on iTunes now. Woo! Nature Boy Ric Flair, the heavyweight champion of the world. Custom made clothes. And any woman in the world I want. Just like that. And now, more Ric Flair. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's Ric Flair um, with the Ric Flair Show along with my fantastic co-host, Conrad Thompson. And today, I've got to tell you, I've got some special guests uh, 
over the last year on the two different podcasts that I've been on now, of course, uh, in a much better place than I was before. But to have this young man um, who I'm going to open the conversation by saying is the greatest professional wrestler in the history of the industry. He is the greatest <laughs> in-ring technician. Ladies and gentlemen, HBK Shawn Michaels. Shawn, thank you so oh much. My goodness. Oh How about my goodness. that, man? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you laid it on <laughs> the The greatest in-ring performer <laughs> in the history of the WWE. And I told someone the other day, because I get asked this all the time, my favorite match of yours or that I've ever seen, and I know you've had some great ones, was you and Taker uh, in Atlanta. Yeah. I thought, no, no, not Atlanta. What, what, what year was it? Oh, no, uh, Houston. Houston, that's right, because we had, you got inducted in Atlanta, Houston. That's we yeah. inducted Steve, uh, and you had the match with Taker, and then Atlanta is where you got you got inducted at uh, WrestleMania here. Because I brought you a belt, which cost about uh, 1% of what the watch cost, but it was still nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was very nice. Uh, yeah. It, 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 it had rubies on it. <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> not to be, not to be confused. Not, not to be. <laughs> they fell out. <laughs> God dang it. <laughs> Whatever oh, they man. Goes in there with the. Uh... <laughs> Well, good. Listen, Conrad, you've met you've met Conrad. You probably don't remember. He sat with us uh, in uh, San Jose, and uh, not last year. What, what oh, yeah. mania was oh, yeah. that? Oh, I remember. Yeah, Conrad. Yeah, he's a, a, a big time real estate guy. Lives in Huntsville, and uh, he put together a bunch of questions today uh, for me and you. It's kind of how we do it. So I don't have a lot of time to think about it. It's all, um, you know, about our careers, how we felt, how we met. You can tell some stories. That I, I, before we get off the air today, I got to have you do one Harley Race impersonation because <laughs> nobody no, can do no, it like you. <laughs> nobody no, can do it. Well, I, you know, I mean, I stole the first thing I did him the best was uh, Kurt Hennig, obviously, and I just yeah. stole my act act from Hennig and, and continued it on over the years. So, so well, let me just make sure I understand. So, basically, you've got this podcast yes. where Conrad interviews you every week basically he's the one yep. that does all the legwork yep. and asks you questions all week and you just talk like you always have right yeah yeah <laughs> that's pretty much it yeah and then and then we yeah. then we touch we, the, we, what we do and, it, and this uh, this is all going to air it's being taped right now what we do is talk about current subjects and our format is where uh you know conrad is a um because I don't, I, I, I'm still just really, really barely learning how to send an email. Um, but um, um, so Rick has a he, podcast, he, but he doesn't know how to listen to the podcast type of guy. Yes. Yeah. Yes, there you go. Yes, That's yes, right. Yes, and yes. I, I actually refuse to change. I'm not gonna. I have no desire to become any more technically uh, advanced than I am right now. So he got a fit anyway, with. He, he got a Fitbit and then took it back to the store when he realized he had to hook it up to a computer. He's that type of guy. <laughs> yeah, I don't even. Think, I don't even think I have to go back to the store. That's the problem. <laughs> well, you know what? I mean, the thing is, you and I are similar. Now, now I know. Obviously, I, I'm more advanced than you are. I don't. I don't. You know. You know, know as much as some folks, and clearly not as much as Conrad. Or Conrad, but I, you know, come a long way. But at the same time, yeah, there's just there's only. You know, I I just I do not sit on my phone or computer all day, and it's just because there's just too much other stuff to for me to do right now. And so it's always good to have somebody that can help you keep you abreast of uh, the going yeah. on of not not just wrestling, but of pop pop culture in general. I mean, heck, as you know, I mean, I never knew, you know, I don't know Jericho and Hunter. And, you know, you used to always make fun of me about the fact that I, you know, I knew current current events news wise, but as far as Hollywood or what you know, the latest music trends and all that kind of stuff, and I got had no idea and still don't. Yeah, well, that, that's what I'm saying too. I I get all my scoop from either Wendy or Conrad, and uh, <laughs> you know, so um, 
Anyway, Conrad, start her out, man. I mean, I, I looked at the questions, and uh, there, there's some great ones. It, uh, some are about, uh, and, and, and one of them, of course, is when you can tell uh, Conrad wants to know how we met, and that's a great story in itself. <laughs> yeah, so, Sean, let's just start with that. Where did you guys first meet? What year was that, and kind of what was the story? Oh, my goodness. Well, that was, uh, it was 1985, and it's funny. I was just telling the story uh, today with the gentleman. <laughs> Well, you know what? I was told him, like, oh, you know, I mean, I got to be back, you know, ideally, if I can be back by five, uh, I got to do Flair's podcast. Of course, kind of like, oh, yeah, you got to you gotta tell him, you know, and my son says brother and woo and all that kind of thing. Like, oh, yes, of course, I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell him. Um, but uh, but I was telling him, it was 1985. Um, I was in Kansas City uh, working the, the Central States area, uh, and H came in with on top, uh, working. I, I think we, we were with Bulldog or Harley Race that night. I, I think actually, I, I think I worked with Bro- with Brody that night the first time. Either oh, yeah. either Brody or Harley, I think. Yeah. Yeah. They usually that they usually kept that. Bulldog for Topeka. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or Hutchinson. Yeah, Harley was uh, Harley wasn't making that drive. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so so. Uh, so anyway, but afterwards, you know, everyone would go to this place. I want to think it said it was like Julie's or something like that. But it was just it was just a small little, uh, you know, nightclub. It wasn't even really a nightclub. It was just a place where there were some pool tables and, you know, and a little bar. Uh, you know, all the, the guys used to go there and hang out. Um, and that was actually back when, you know, because I was only 19 at the time. That's back when the drinking age was 18. And, and uh you know, I, 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 I was going up to the bar to order a beer. If an age came up and he came, he said, what are you having, kid? And, uh, and, and I, said, uh, I said, I said, just a beer. He goes, and he goes, I got it. And uh, so he bought me a beer. And then, of course, you know, then, of course, I thought, okay, here's my opportunity. I've watched him for years. And, of course, I just, you know, had to take that moment to let him know. You know what he, you know what he meant to me as, as you know, as a wrestler. You know, it's one of those things where you just, you know, you got your one chance to give your five minute spiel about, you know, how you think he's just the greatest thing since sliced bread and yada yada yada. And uh, all I know is that, you know, thank you very much. And and he left. And all I know is that I never, I didn't buy a drink for the rest of the night. But that was, that was, uh, that was the first <laughs> time uh, that I ever, that I ever met her. How are you doing, sweetheart? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was fabulous. Yeah, yeah. story of my life. <laughs> Bar tabs everywhere. And the whole yeah, time, you, know, you can't you can't see the motion that I'm doing right now with my arm, but the whole time at the bar he was doing that too. He was doing the the swimming the swimming thing that he does with his arms and tell you know? <laughs> <laughs> we used to be overseas. We'd be overseas in six van tags, Hunter, and, and oh, Sean would start to match, and he would come over, swing his arm, tap himself on his shoulder, take take my hand and take my two fingers and put them on his pulse and then mine, <laughs> not my forehead. <laughs> and twenty thousand people were dying for it. Are you kidding me? That's what was so ridiculous. What was funny is, yeah, what's funny is, funny thing. Every time we worked together, I mean, the first ten minutes of the match in live events, you know, if it was, I mean, if it was me, Hunter, and Rick in any kind of match, a six man in in any way, shape, or form, the three of us were in there. The first ten minutes were all of us doing Rick, you know, the various little (laughs) little things before we ever ever locked up, pulling on the rope, doing the swimming. At the arms, doing the strut, the woo, the pull of the rope, you know, taking your taking your own pulse junk like oh, Are you trying? To, are you implying that I have uh, idiosyncrasies or ticks? Yeah. You you got a bunch of serious ticks that half the world don't even know about, man. <laughs> uh, I told you this would, this would be a good one, Conrad. So, guy, Red, go, go ahead. You haven't even asked the question yet. Well, I'm no, dying. I'm having a good time. I think everybody is just listening to you guys. But uh, eventually, we're going to talk about your last match together. But let's talk about your first match. Was that back in '91 in the WWF? Uh, how did that come about? Because Sean was in a tag match, a tag team at the time. Well, yeah, here's okay, I'll tell you. Oh, 
Oh, go ahead. Uh, it, it, it was in Corpus no, Christi. No, no, I was going to say you'd know. You, I, I was going to say I knew where it was, but at that time, that was before I had – I mean, nobody ever told me anything except what to do with no wrestling. So I don't even know – Rick might have to be a better skinny on – no, I don't. I don't know how it came about either. I just got the TV, and they said, "God, you're getting to wrestle Shawn Michaels," and I think it was pretty well. I think that it was pretty well assumed that Shawn was going to be the next big thing in the company at that point already, even though he was still doing some tag matches. I think after that, he did this thing with the mirror, where you broke the mirror with Janetti. Do you remember that? Um, well, well, no. Well, and that's the thing. No, I mean, I think because I was still in the tag match. I, I don't know how much time it was after that. We had like we had six minutes. That I yeah that I ever went single. So it was just one of those. Honestly, uh, and again, it's one of the, uh, you know, I know very little about it. It's just one of those I think random things to where uh, they wanted what you know the deal. You have have have, have a decent match. Let him work with one of the Rogers. And, you know, and somebody says, which one? And somebody says, well, you know, let's, you know, Sean do it. I mean, every, I think everybody knew that I was just such a, you know, a huge fan of Rick. So for, just to give me the opportunity to be in there with him, I think there's probably somebody in, you know, a booker or a producer or somebody, um, you know, an agent that, that, that knew that. And think, oh, Sean will get a kick out of that opportunity. Go ahead and let him do it. I say, yeah, we had six minutes. And so there was very Yeah, it was fine. You just yeah, yeah, you just do the best. But in in that six minutes that. he did in that six minutes he did press slam me. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. He he goes, I can't get you up. I said, Watch. <laughs> yeah. I was actually I was actually halfway decent at that time still, or I could <laughs> it was oh, just man. up well, and no, down. Yeah, well and again I tell you, it, it's uh you know, for for me it's one of those things that again, you don't I heck I don't I don't I don't know the future and, and so for me this is uh, you know, a huge opportunity. You're, you're you're in there with the guy that you always dreamed about being in there with. It's it's uh, a huge opportunity. And then and then it's you you, you gosh, it's the fastest six minutes uh, you ever had. Yeah. But again, it's yeah. at that time again. I don't know that you can you know people can put it in perspective now because everybody sees everything in the rearview mirror. But at that time, I didn't know I didn't know what tomorrow held, and so. At that particular time in Corpus Christi, Texas, that was about uh, you know the greatest night I'd had in my career up to that point. Well, thank you. You're very nice. I'll tell you. Here's the lead into it. Um, and Sean will remember this. The night before, uh, or a day before, um, <laughs> we were in New York City, and I got I was in a China club with all the guys with the Nasty Boys and all that. And remember, I lost my Rolex. <laughs> One of them. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, I lost. And, and that's a, so that's the night before we were Corpus. Yeah, I, I wanted to kill Brian Knobs. It was it was it, it, I guess it was a, a week where I hadn't seen Brian. I can't remember what the what, maybe it was a, a week later or three or four days, but I hadn't seen Brian because I said, Brian, please don't tell anybody, you know. And of course, I'm walking to TV in Cincinnati. And he goes, hey, Flair, what time is it? You know, Brian. <laughs> Jesus. So, <Flair. laughs> yeah. So I, I until, and, and this is the thing that, I mean, we can't even, there was not enough time. But do I understood how much fun, and really at that point, how much camaraderie, I, I'm always going to use that word camaraderie, that the 80s and the 90s had. It, it's hard to understand because the work schedule was so, difficult and so um, um, unmanageable and, uh, and for personal lives, basically, and I'm, I'll pretty much stand on that. Um, it was just hard. We, you were never home, and you had to have friends to hang out. You had to have friends to exist, and I think uh, yeah. even, though a lot of the, even though a lot of those friendships don't carry on, like I think, uh, you know, Sean's probably got five or six guys. I've got five or six guys. Um but it's you know of the, of the of all the guys you think that we travel with, work with, and had fun with, they 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 become fewer and far between. But and if you didn't have it in that time frame, it, it's always been my thought process that you wouldn't be able to survive. I mean, you go into your room. Yeah. You, you, we can count the number of guys that went to the room at night and look what happened. I mean, it, it's nothing good yeah. about that. You've got to be able to laugh and have well, some fun. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, it uh, it was it was it was a different time and. Uh, and, and yeah, we were working so hard. We were, we were all we had, each other had. So 
Mm-hmm. Um, we, we certainly made the best of it. I don't know that it was, you know, looking back, clearly I can say, well, it might not have been the healthiest thing to do, but, you know, but at that yeah. time, that, 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 that's the way it was back then. But, um, you know, again, I mean, I, I, having survived it all wouldn't change it for the world. So, yeah, myself included. I might not have gotten married four times, but <laughs> aside from that, <laughs> actually, I was retired when I got married twice, so what a dumbass I am. Excuse me. <laughs> so, Sean, anyway, I think, uh, Sean, Sean was supposed to be in one of the weddings and didn't make it. Now I'm glad you weren't there. <laughs> Remember, Rebecca couldn't find her passport, and you couldn't come, and yeah. now I'm glad you weren't there. <laughs> what a tragedy that was, <laughs> an expensive tragedy. <laughs> well, well, go ahead, Conrad. Uh, Sean, I think most folks listening to the podcast have seen the old photo where you sort of mimicked Rick's pose from an old Pro Wrestling Illustrated cover. Oh, yeah. What yeah. was it about Rick that made him special to you as a fan, as a kid? Well, look, I mean, and it's funny because, he, he, again, he was just busting my chops the other day about uh, Tully Blanchard. But, I mean, <laughs> uh, so much of it, which, and the irony is, I mean, again, all, all these, all those years later, Tully would go to go to the Carolinas, become one of the horsemen. Um, but, I mean, it started uh, with Southwest Championship Wrestling. My entire everything uh, with wrestling started with Southwest Championship Wrestling. And, uh, and, and this was before cable. So again, to me, this is the only wrestling I was exposed to. And, and Tully Blanchard was, again, I would later figure out that he was sort of our version of Rick Slayer there in South Texas. But then not too long after that cable comes along. And then of course it's WTBS and you're watching uh, world championship wrestling out of Atlanta. And that was, you know, my, my, my first exposure to Rick. And then of course, and he took what I, liked so much about Tully, but then it was just so much bigger and so much more. And with the, with the blonde hair, I mean, again, uh, it, you know, and, and, and gosh, you, you know, Tully talked about the planes and the cars and this, that, and the other, but you never saw him. Gosh, with Rick, you saw him coming off of the Learjet. You saw him walking out of the limousine. He showed you the Rolex. I mean, it was just all of a sudden he made this line of work just look like it was the absolute greatest gig in the world um and it, and it just well it did i mean it just drew me in it i mean it made me fall in love with not just you know that character but the idea of what being a wrestler would be i mean i could i guess and there was there was as you know i mean there were countless other guys that were wrestlers on television but nobody sort of embodied this fantasy in, in, in certainly this 15 year old kid's head of what the wrestling business could be. And, and, and I think that's what made Rick so appealing to me is that he just made everything about the job uh, so incredibly cool. I mean, he, I mean, he was, it was, yeah, I, I would imagine it's sort of like what people felt like Joe Namath did to being a quarterback way back when, uh, and, you know, with his commercials and the women and the this, that, and the other, just, yeah. Made it look like he was the coolest guy in the world, and and again, all of that just it drew me in, and and, and, and again, the, um, uh, and, and and I can remember <clears throat> that time him walking out on WTBS, and he and and he had the championship for the first time. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I mean, and because when the way we got it, you would just hear about, um, you know, these big matches that would happen at the Omni and. And, and, of course, back then, championship titles never changed on television. You just, you know, it was just wasn't. And, and, of course, we never, you know, there wasn't the Internet back then. And, and, and even if, which I did, I, even if you subscribed to Wrestling Magazine, none of that stuff, you, know, you didn't get that stuff until a month later. And so you'd hear about these huge matches going on you know, at the Omni, and they'd talk about these other places, in Greensboro, and this. And you just sort of wondered, my goodness, what was going on? What would happen? And, and then, of course, you know, them talking about this, this big match. And, and after a while, they didn't, you know, they didn't, you know, it wasn't like today. The title didn't change hands, you know, to 15, 20 guys over the years. I mean, gosh, one guy had it. And after a while, you just sort of got used to the fact that, okay, well, nobody, you know, this guy's not going to win it. And then I can remember, you know, again, that match being billed. And, and then the next week, Rick came out with the championship. It was like, oh. 
oh my goodness. And now he was the man. And then, and then that just gave credibility to everything that he said. You know what I mean? So it was, so now, I mean, it was, you know, all his bad behavior that he encouraged on television just got rewarded. And so, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, Thank I, you. I was, hey. I was too, yeah, I was, I was too young to put it all together about what a bad road that would be to travel. <laughs> but, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. 15, you know, 15 year old uh, kid, man, that was the coolest thing in the world. Yeah, and, and you mentioned the name. Don't think I didn't take a little bit of, bit of my stuff from, obviously, the late, great Ali, but I got a lot of stuff from Joe Namath. That was, that was you know, just a couple of years ahead of me. As a matter of fact, I'm yeah. going to see him. I, I've, gotten to, I've gotten to be around him three times, and it'll be a fourth time, August 5th, I'm going to a show with him. Um, and, God, what a great guy. <laughs> he's too much. Yeah. I know he's got. I know he's got to lay low, but he had, he's still a lot of fun to be with. Boy, but you know, you just see him walk in a room. You know, you go to yourself. Even though he wears his glasses now because his eyesight's bad, that are and the lenses are pretty thick. You just say, Jesus, that's Joe Namath. I mean, there's some people that walk in a room and just I don't care who you think you are, you just become a regular person. And he certainly was. Well, like I, me. I always love. Yeah, you know, well, I always love the story you used to tell about. It was it was uh, like Buddy Rogers, right? He yeah. Up, he said, you know, what, what's, that, what's the line he said to you? Yeah, you know. uh, <laughs> gay kid. He called me over to Greensboro and said, hey, kid, there's only one diamond in this business, and you're looking at him. <laughs> and you're looking at him, yeah. You know, <laughs> you're looking at him, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, well, and, that's, that's what's, and, and, and so I guess it's just neat because, you know, all these years later, Conrad, I mean, for me, so you talk about that match with the Rockets, and then, of course, and then, then X amount of years later, and, you know, Rick and I have a match at, you know, I don't know, a pay-per-view in Houston where it's, you know, whatever. We get together and we go through a table. But still, we don't, have a, we don't have a ton of time. We're not a big match. something they used to do together. And then, of course, you know, you think, like, oh, you know, that might be my only opportunity, you know. Um, and, 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 and so, uh, for, for me, it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing evolution, just like I'm sure it is for Rick. I mean, even Rick had his, you know, I had my Rick Flair, and Rick had his somebody. I mean, Buddy Rogers, yeah. and Mike, he was talking about Joe Namath. And yeah, I, actually, it, 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 it was Ray Stevens, Ray Stevens, yeah. who you who you got yeah. to meet, but you met him way late in his career. Um, yeah, well, but, but, yeah, but Ray, yeah, Ray was still, I mean, but that's the thing. You watch him, and he was, you know, you go back and you watch him and Pat. And it's yeah, it's and I know. You just, you can't imagine. How ahead of their time they yeah. were. You so you you you, you have seen Ray work before uh, when he was younger, on tape. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know you had because that's hard footage to get. And if you haven't yeah. seen Ray Stevens, and I'm saying this on the podcast in the '60s, boy, you haven't lived. He that kid was too much, man. Unbelievable. Upside down, over around, <laughs> Jesus. Yes. And it's I guess it's stuff that again that you know that you did. You know, in the eighties, I did in the nineties, two thousand, and and they ooed and odd then. And I'm just mm-hmm. telling you, he was doing it in the sixties, and you you just you you have to really, you've got to take yourself out of the mindset you're in now, and you've got to put it in the sixties, and you go, oh my goodness, Ray was such a trailblazer, and yes. so ahead of his time. It's it you it's it's staggering, and I don't think anybody. It's because again, the internet, this, that, you know, everything wasn't around then. But I don't think you, know, I don't know anybody who knows anything about this line of work doesn't put Ray Stevens uh, at the top of their list as far as guys who were the best that ever did this stuff. Yeah. So, well, in, in going back, I think I've told you this, Conrad, but Ray would take the turnbuckle, hook his foot, fall back, then they'd throw Pat in. Pat would go over the top of Ray, hook his foot, and fall back on top of Ray. They're both laying there, hooked yeah. on the same turnbuckle. I mean, it was unreal. I yeah. mean, I, when I saw that, the first time I saw that, they're wrestling the Crusher and Bruiser in Minneapolis, I was out of my mind. <laughs> yeah. and, if they, and, and if they and needed to, they each could go all the way forward, hit their head on the post, fall back. Exactly. And be, bleed, and be bleeding by the time they, they fell back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I used to tell people, if yeah. I went down to the matches in Minneapolis, which I did when I was old enough to start driving because my dad would take me once in a while, but once I could drive, if he didn't do that flip in the match <laughs> – I was so damn mad. You know what I mean? Yeah. I can remember people said, well, why do you do that every night? I said, well, 
if it gave me that much pleasure, I know that people out there are digging it too. Nobody ever complained. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. And then, and then of course, then Sean took it to another level, and then you know, I just so much to think about. But um, yeah, I just uh, just so thrilled um, thinking about all our times together. And I do remember because in Houston, they were they were go- they were the, I, our match was there to get. Um, Sean in position Randy. to wrestle Randy, right? So yeah. we, they yep. spent the whole day trying to figure out what to have Randy do. <laughs> right? Right. So, yeah. Which is, and, which is, and it was funny. You were just like, I, just, I want to go through the table. Just put me through the table. Yeah. I, I, remember, I mean, I, you know, that, these table bumps, they seem to be the big thing everybody wants to do. So make sure you put me yeah. through the table. I'm like, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, what are just yeah, let's do something everybody's doing. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, it's uh, funny because you're it's funny, I forgot about that. You're right, because they did everybody spent all day on how to you know, okay, but how's Randy gonna come in? And then nobody even <laughs> so I mean clearly I think it was yeah. fun. I mean it, it just it it wasn't you know, the match was you know, the match was sort of a backdrop to trying to introduce, you know, Randy to, to a storyline with me and sometimes that's yeah. just the, you know, that's just the position you got. You got to make the best of it. And, uh, you know, so, you know, uh, and, and again, it's all, you know, no, nobody cares now because, you know, heck, Rick and I got to have our matches at WrestleMania. But at that time, you know, in Houston, man, we didn't know that we didn't know that moment was coming. And so you're like, no. oh, man, you know, here it is. I mean, I, what, are, what are the, you know, what are the chances that I'm going to get another shot with Rick? And now I'm, yeah. you know, I'm better at my, I, you know, I, I'm now better at my job than I was the first time and you know and he and he and he can still go and now we you know we're both in a position where we you know we'd really like to you know we know each other now we you know we love and respect each other and are good friends and now we'd really like to you know build on that you know yeah. on that match we had all those years ago but the situation doesn't you know it's right it doesn't call for that. And then of yeah. course you know it's it's sort of like, oh man, that sort of that sort of sucks. But again, that is not knowing the future and and what the future the future would hold, of course. And again, to me, uh, you know, you, you can't you can't beat uh, you can't beat what we eventually got a got an opportunity to do. So, Rick, yeah, kind of walk uh, us through that retirement angle and how that well, all came let me, about. Let me just throw out one thing, and, I, and I'm sure Sean has so many on his mind. But I'm, I'm going back to he and I. I think the best match, best match Sean and I ever had was in Japan in Tokyo. Uh, Besides for WrestleMania, you know, which I've which I've pointed yeah. out, I could I could still perform at a decent level, and we were, they gave us like 30 minutes in Japan. It was the same night that Angle wrestled the uh, Undertaker. Remember? Yeah, no, and what was that? That was some kind of big event over there, right? I can't even. In, in Japan, I yeah, they made they made TV. Yeah, yeah it was a TV, yeah. but they gave us a lot of time, and 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 for sure. I was a, a clear cut, which is hard to get in Japan. Definitive. I was a heel. He was a bay face. I mean, you know, and it was it was really good. Yeah, yeah. And the Jap and the Japanese, um, I found out. I mean, because sometimes those guys are hard to work with. Uh, but in my experience, when I, a couple times, I got to work with Steamboat and Rick Martell over there, and man, they they, they bought it because you can't have that kind of match. There's about three Japanese guys: Tenru, Fujinami, and uh, maybe. Um, I'm having our his name will come to me. Um, that can wrestle our, our that can wrestle our style, you know, and will sell a little bit, you know. Otherwise, you're just right. Yeah, I mean, it just was so hard when I first started going there. They wouldn't sell crap, you know. And I thought, okay, yeah. so I'm, and and if they they didn't like me begging off. I said, okay, guys, I ain't getting the suplex more than three hundred times a night, okay? So right. I, <laughs> I'm staying down and I'm begging off. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. No. laughs> Yeah, well, and also that, yeah, that 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 match was also again. You, if I recall correctly, you know, yeah, you were you you had a you were you know full scale heel then. I was full scale, yeah, you know, baby face, and 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 so it, it was, yeah, there was there wasn't there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, it was, it was a very good you know good guy versus bad guy, yeah, you know, so uh, and also that you know they you know by that time everybody knew. You know the Sean Rick story. You know eventually, obviously, it would it'd be played up even bigger. But you know, just because because that is one of the huge advantages. You know, even to the you know the power of the internet and, and all the all the times we've worked with each other, that we've told that that story enough times that 
that even in a place as far away as Japan, you know, they had come to appreciate the story and who we were as as wrestlers, as workers mm-hmm. then. And so uh, that match, you know, was an opportunity for us to to go out there as you know in front of the, the Japanese folks and you know as as you know two of the you know two of the better wrestlers that uh, the world's seen in in a while, and, and that, that obviously made that one uh, pretty top notch as well. Yeah, I feel the same way. So go ahead, uh, Conrad. I know you want to ask about the retirement, and um, yeah, I just, I just uh, wanted to know who's that I'm very proud of because um, I'll just start out by saying I think Sean uh, asked to work with me at the retirement. Uh, I, I would have never had an opportunity. Um, I mean, I, I, they just said you're retiring. <laughs> it wasn't like pick out who you want, and I think Sean volunteered to wrestle me. And then, of course, the rest is history. It was probably the most fun angle I ever had, even though he called me old yeller and all that stuff. <laughs> Could it take you out behind the barn, old yeller? <laughs> that was great. Columbia, uh, South Carolina, yeah. it was tremendous. Yeah, well, but of course, you know, of course, I asked. I said, look, I've got, I've got what I think is some really good material, but, you, I mean, you guys let me know. You know, because and one of the things that look, Rick told me this story a long time ago, and, and I believe it to be true. And and so, uh, but you know, again, the business changes, and I'm just you know, and I don't know. I, I'm, I'm never sure where you should use it, where you shouldn't use it. Sometimes, you know, you got to go against the grain and tradition and stuff like that for stuff to work. But I, I always remember you, you know, telling me that story about uh, um, you know, who was it? What, what, what walked across the room and smacked him and said, oh, uh, Wahoo, you know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, I remember Rick telling me a story when, you know, back in the day when they used to just sit there and cut promos. And, oh, you know, yeah, when, when, when Wahoo smacked Valentine, Rick Valentine. Yeah. Yeah, Valentine was sitting there telling, you know, cutting a promo. Back when they, and uh, call him a, and call him a big fat time. Indian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Call <laughs> him a big fat Indian. <laughs> walked, walked over there, smacked him right in the face and said, kids, fat don't throw money. Yeah, you know, and, 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 and yeah, true and story. I've seen it all, man. Change the promo. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, the, the same it, the same thing happened with uh, funny. I've t- I know Conrad knows the story. We're doing promo, same format, same bunch of guys, and I can't remember what Ole Anderson said about Jack Mulligan, but brother, <laughs> if, you, if you thought that Wahoo slapped Greg Valentine, you should have seen what Mulligan did to what Ole Anderson, man. He's still yeah. trying to find his ass in the bleachers. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> and I, well, look, but that's, something, but that's something, you know, you said, you told me that story years ago. And I can, yeah. I like, you know what? But there's something. And, and then, it, look, it dawned on me one time. Look, if somebody said, you know, I was whatever. I mean, of course, you know, whatever. I'm, I was getting up to whatever. I was 39 or 40. You know, and but I'm, you know, wrestling somebody who's 25 or whatever. And he, and he did the same, you know, he did the same thing. And of course, the first time you hear it, you get, ooh, you know, it stings a little bit. But then you know, oh, heck, I said it as a young guy. But then, I'll, but and, and then I, but I just said, look. And I, so I, I, I never, you know, I, I never stopped anybody from cutting the promo. All I did was when he was done, I said, look, and I just want you to think about this because I'm, you know, and I told him the story that Rick told me, and I mm-hmm. said, look, just something to think about is that always know where you're sort of going with this stuff. I said because when everything's said and done, I said ultimately in this angle. You know what I mean? Because I'm going on yeah. to work with so-and-so. I'm going over. So you sit there, you're going to call me an old man, and that's fine, and I don't mind. But you got to understand, I'm going to kick you and then beat you. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah. when you you know, hey. always know where you're going because you're about to get beat by an old man. Yeah, and the thing <laughs> of it is, is, if you think about it, that, that, that is, if you can't find better material than you're an old man, you, you're not much on the stick anyway. Does that make sense? I mean, that, yeah. that's oh, just, no. well, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about just in, what, in a random interview. That, right. And, and that is like, so that is why I, I asked you about it because I didn't want it to be, it wasn't, it wasn't old, wasn't the stress. It wasn't. The no, point. no, but it was point, great. You can, I wasn't saying it because I was well, upset. But, I loved it. No, no. Oh yeah. No, no, I know. But I'm just saying, and, but I think it's just, a, well, again, to me, this, this speaks to, you know, the, uh, simplistic psychology as opposed to what I think is, Good psychology, which I always felt like I've had, which is it wasn't about being old. It was about the fact that 
you know, somebody that loved that dog when, you know, had, because they loved him so much, he had to get him back behind the shed and kill him. And that's what it was. It was a mercy killing. And that was the difference. So, you know, for me, you know, the, all the old yellow stuff in that promo was more about, you know, love, which again, I always go back and I always try to, I always tell people, look, I mean, you have to understand that the, the retirement match with Rick, I said, you know, people always look at me like I got, you know, two heads because they don't understand that for me, it was a love story. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, yeah. And I, and they always look at me like, oh my goodness, this kid's just, this guy's just out for lunch for God's sakes. But, uh, you know, I told the story about how I woke up in the middle of the night and I started writing it down and I just started weeping on the paper. And, and again, so that's where even the, even the promo is going up to it, you know, and, and the old yellow stuff, it was, again, it was about, you know, it was about someone being put into a position that they did not envy and they were going to have to do something and put it into something that they didn't want to put it into. And the reason they didn't want to put it into it is because, you know, that person, that everything about that meant so much to them. And again, that's, that's the conflict that HBK and the character were going through or was going through in, in the whole, in the, in the, in the whole storyline with Rick. And that's what made it so, uh, for me, uh, enjoyable to do because, and especially if you knew, like Rick stated earlier, they didn't give him a choice. You know, they said, "Look, you're retired. <laughs> That's that." Well, no, but, but you know, and, and but it, and, and it did bother him, and, it, and 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 so the weeks going up to it and stuff like that, he was emotional, and and, and again, so all of that, that whole thing yeah, it was very was real. Such so Sean, in explaining the old yeller analogy, was explaining that he had to put the end to something he didn't want to see end. And we don't want to see this interview end, so we're going to keep it going right here next week on the Ric Flair Show. Tune in for part two with Sean Michaels. We continue our WrestleMania 24 discussion, all the emotion, all the realness that existed in that situation. We get the full story on the Rolex situation. And, of course, we ask Rick the tough question, do you regret wrestling after that? We cover that. We've got some Harley Race stories. How did Sean feel tag teaming with God and having God do the J-O-B to Vince McMahon? Was that ridiculous or what? We get all those questions, even some Harley Race impressions, and the one time that Sean decided to nature once he became the champion in WWE. We've got all that on part two of the Shawn Michaels interview right here on the Ric Flair Show. But don't tune out yet. This episode is not done. On the other side of this break, we've got This Week in History. We've got Ask Nate. We've got the voicemail of the week. So we're not done telling stories. We're not done telling jokes. We've got more on the other side of this break. It's the Ric Flair Show right here on the MLW Radio Network at RicFlairShow.com. <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if you had your very own big gold belt? Well, now's your chance. We're giving away an autographed big gold belt. If you were to cruise over to the WWE shop, you would pay hundreds of dollars for this belt, but we're going to get it autographed by Ric Flair and to you for free. All you've got to do to be eligible is take a screenshot where you subscribe to the Ric Flair Show on iTunes and then tweet it out on social media using hashtag Ric Flair Show. Once again, screenshot where you have followed the show on iTunes and then tweet out that that screenshot using hashtag Ric Flair Show. We're going to pick one winner in two weeks, and we're going to get you your very own version of the big gold belt autographed by Ric Flair. Thanks for listening to the Ric Flair Show. If you enjoy the podcast, the way to support the show the best is two things. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes, if at all possible. If you don't have iTunes, get iTunes. Download it on your computer. Subscribe. It helps. And while you're there, leave a five-star review. That's what helps pay the bills. That's what makes this show free to you. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a five-star review. And if you tweet out a picture of it and use the hashtag Ric Flair Show, we're going to get you your chance at a big gold belt signed by the Nature Boy. Okay, so we're on a roll here, landing the cameos for the first family mortgage spot, and you already know what the deal is here. We're trying to pay some bills, and we're trying to save you some money on your bills, and you can do that at 1FMC.com. Isn't that right? That's right, baby. That's first family mortgage, baby. Funky like a monkey. It's too hot to handle, too cold to hold. Come on, you know what to do. This will never get old. 425-0105. Or check us out online. What's that website again? Baby, that's 1FMC.com, if you will. It is now time for This Week in History on The Ric Flair Show. Brought to you by MidAtlanticGateway.com. 
Dick Bourne is celebrating the memories of Jim Crockett promotions every day at MidAtlanticGateway.com. Since the beginning of time, people have dreamt of the unfathomable. The dreamers have turned into champions and the champions to immortals. Tonight, WCW brings you the unimaginable. Two champions, 12-time WCW champion Ric Flair and five-time WWF champion Hulk Hogan. When these two worlds collide, a new universe will emerge with only one ruler, one champion. Live from Orlando, Florida, the match of the century as WCW presents Back at the Beach. It's the Orlando Arena, and it's Bench at the Beach. Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan, finally tonight. All right, Rick, so this week in history, brought to you by the MidAtlanticGateway.com, and we're going back to 1994, July to be exact. It's Bash at the Beach 94. You finally faced Hulk Hogan in a pay-per-view. It had never happened before. What was the deal? What was the scoop? Well, he had come uh, to WCW. Uh, he had um, finished filming Thunder in Paradise after he left WWE. And, uh, you know, it was a big deal. And uh, even though we had wrestled, you know, multiple times uh, in the WWE, uh, we had never wrestled in a pay-per-view. Um, so um, they put this together, and it was that was the Bash of the Beach was the theme of our shows back then. And uh, Sherry Martell, they got Jack involved, Mr. T. And uh, I I looked back at it maybe a year ago on the network, and we actually had a heck of a match. And the finish came off great, and uh, Hulkamania was up and running, man. Yeah, I saw it for the first time in a long time this week, too. And I saw Linda Hogan front and center in the front row just losing her mind for the finish. What type yeah. of uh, match do you think – uh, you, you expected is that exactly what you expected, or did you expect it to be a little more difficult than what it turned out to be? Oh no, I had worked on it before. Working with him's like it's, it's like a dream come true. It's so easy. In fact, yeah, there's a couple of guys that are like, uh, you know, I mean, I'm using Sean's example. Some guys you can just work with, and it's it it, it it's it's supposed to come across as work, but it actually. Um, it, it's it's just a pleasure. It's like Steamboat. Uh, Hulk was the same way. Sting. I mean, just it's it it it, it mean it, it, yes yes it's a, it's physical and do I take a lot of bumps and that? But I mean the crowd reacts to everything. It's easy. Sherry Martel was a phenomenal manager. Actually, in my estimation, second only to uh, Bobby Heenan. I mean, she was phenomenal. And her jumping off the top rope and stuff like that. It's just it, she's classic. And that that was Sherry Martel. So it was so much fun and. Uh, you know, and then Hulk and I have wrestled about five or six more times you know, over the years for WCW, maybe ten more times. But it was it was great, and I, re I really had a good time. So this was one of the big shows that um, Bischoff had helped put together, am I right? So the, yes. at the time, the, the feeling backstage had to be that you guys were about to take over WWE, right? The feeling backstage, we're about to take over WWE. Well, I'm just saying, in terms of popularity, I mean, all of a sudden you've got the biggest attraction of all time, and you're putting together this super match. It had to feel like a big shot over the bow to the WWF at the time because you guys you had know, the big you know, marquee it's match. It's funny, I never thought of it like that, but I, I don't think. I tell you something. I after working for Vince and having been there and and seen the the commitment and the vision and everything that he has brought. You know, and, and look where it's at today. Uh, I never looked at anybody threatening WWE. Uh, is that funny? Even in, in 97 or whatever, all this stuff was going down and we were getting better ratings. I just, when you know, when you meet the guy and, and you work for him, and he just, uh, like I said the one time, I said, why do you balance all this? I mean, you know, what, what, how do you ever, why do you, how do you keep your head high every day? He said, I have to. I got 300 people here in the building that can't see me with my head down. Does that make sense? Wow, that's a big deal. Yeah, he just he he won't uh, he doesn't he doesn't sell. 
in our business, that terminology, he does not sell. <laughs> Well, we are going to sell. We're going to sell some visitors to go to Mid-Atlantic Gateway. That was This Week in History, brought to you by MidAtlanticGateway.com. Check it out right now. And on the other side, we've got Ask Nate, and this is a fun one. Uh, we've got uh, something that we've never done before. We've got an audio clip for Ask Nate. Hit me. Okay, so let's go to Twitter, and we've got a great question here. Uh, at Greg Eskridge on Twitter asks, Please tell me Rick has heard AJ Styles' impersonation of him from Talk is Jericho Hashtag nature hoot. So here's the deal, Rick. Uh, Jericho had Carl Anderson, Luke Gallows, and AJ Styles on his show last week. And AJ did an impersonation of you. And I'm going to play that for you now. And uh, listen towards the end. Get out of here, man. I mean, have Is the nature hoot here? The nature hoot is here, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I love hey, these cast you, of characters. How you doing, Nature Hood? Oh, the Nature Hood is partying <laughs> with the podcast brothers tonight, <laughs> and I'm having a great time. Nature Hood, do you think Chris Jericho's ever wrestled Harley Race? Uh, hey, Chris, do you ever wrestle Harley Race? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, I have not, uh, Nature oh, Hood. Man, he's the best, but I'm telling you what. Maybe brother. you guys should give him a call. <laughs> <laughs> well, what time is it? Oh, it's, it's 6 a.m. at uh, <laughs> can't, can't East time, so I'm serious up. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> this is so good, dude. Your nature. I love oh, your nature. nature. We, we used to do. Oh. What do you know about What, was what do you know about, about $40,000? <laughs> uh, <geez. laughs> <laughs> what was fun about Japan was like we got to come back your hoot off because we're going to yeah. get kicked out of here. All right, Nature Hood. Yeah, get kicked out. We're Nature Hood was really good seeing you. All right, Rick, so it sounds like AJ's just having a good time. Uh, anything you want to respond to there? Uh, nothing. Uh, Imitation is the greatest form of flattery. I love AJ. Uh, I have all the time in the world for him. We've got to think it's relatively as close as we could be at DNA. And uh, I certainly have a lot of respect for him. I think the world of uh, Luke Gallows, uh, I've gotten to know him real well. He's a very talented guy. And the Anderson kid, um, he sounds like Shane Douglas trying to be cute. And I guess he can be cute next time he sees me. Because I'll bring it up to him. Well, all right. That was uh, hashtag Ask Nate. Uh, let's lighten the mood a little bit. Let's do the voice. <laughs> no, it, it's a, it is what it is. They take these shots and, you know. The problem is, is that uh, if you say it, <laughs> you got to be held accountable. So I knew what he was saying, and uh, you know he, he could say it to my face. Well, let's uh, let's have a little fun. Let's do the voicemail of the week. I think this may be the funniest one yet, Rick. Let's go to the caller right now. Hey, champ! Super day from Vicksburg, Mississippi. Just got one question for you. Since you were so good with the ladies, what was your what was the line that you would throw down to help get the midgets laid? Thanks, champ. All right, Rick. What's uh, <laughs> what's the line that you laid down? Listen, that that <laughs> my favorite story you ever read in my book is about Cowboy Lang, who passed in 2007, and I declared a national moment of silence for the legendary Cowboy Lang. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I was driving a cowboy in Little Tokyo around in my El Dorado, you know. Cowboy would always say, get me laid, Nate, get me laid, Nate, get me laid. And I'd say, Jesus, calm down. It's hard to get a little midget laid, you know. And then so he'd, <laughs> he'd walk in the bathroom, take off his clothes, and the rest is history. <laughs> That's how you say you get him getting midget laid. But that was Cowboy Lang. Little Tokyo was a little harder. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Lang would always say to me, big man, da-da, little man, all. <laughs> <laughs> I won't use the verbiage. Don't want no short, short man. Wow, that's awesome, man. All right, well, let's get out of here. Let's do some quick plugs, some shout outs for the week. Of course, we can't thank our guest enough. Find him on Twitter at Sean Michaels. And be sure to tune in next week for part two of our Sean Michaels interview. Uh, and of course, we want to thank at 1FMC. Where's the best place to get a mortgage or a home loan, Ric Flair? First Family Mortgage. Come on. Check us out at MLW. First Family Mortgage in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, but it's diversified in, in how many cities now, Conrad? Uh, I don't know, like 25 states. 25 states. Okay, well, that's. I know you just – business is good, folks. And now, can I mention the new, the new uh, 
um, loan system that's working out for you? We'll do that next week. Uh, we want to go. Okay. <laughs> Let's go We're ahead. Keep it under wraps. Okay, I got to be careful, guys. I can't. Be, you know, he he's worried about making too much money and not telling me about it. Okay, go ahead. That is the concern. I'm trying to fund uh, <laughs> wedding number five down here at the Conrad. <laughs> trying, so. trying to fund wedding number five. <laughs> uh, hypothetically, tell us about At Legacy Talent LLC. At Legacy Talent. Um, the greatest agency in the country, Belinda Morrisoni, the agent, the brand maker, the woman that has supported me and helped push me through so many controversial moments, kept me afloat. And uh, once again, I would highly recommend uh, Legacy Talent for anybody that wants to build a brand. And uh, we're trying to build a brand here for Major League Wrestling. You can go ahead and check them. Exactly. You can check them out at MLW. Of course, Mid Atlantic Gateway is at MA Gateway. I am at Hey Hey, it's Conrad on Twitter. Check us out. And next week, part two of the Showstopper, the main event, the Heartbreak Kid, Sean Michaels. Sean, HBK, thank you so much, my friend. Thank you so much. MLWRadio.com is the place to go to binge on wrestling podcasts from the experts, those who've been in the business at its highest levels, also those with razor-sharp insight and stories that you can only get at MLW Radio Network. This week, actor and former WWE creative team member Freddie Prince Jr. talks about his time in WWE and even drops some Star Wars Rebel spoilers on the VIP lounge with VIP and Greeny. Pro wrestling and MMA executive Court Bauer and Mr. St. Laurent break down the 2016 WWE draft and discuss a backstage throwdown, the New Japan GI Climax, and an NXT star at a crossroads, all on the network's flagship show, MLW Radio. Then tomorrow, the Jim Cornette experience goes uncut and uncensored as only the Louisville Slugger can. Plus, much, much more. Subscribe to these shows for free. The world of MLW Radio never stops. Go to MLWRadio.com and binge on pro wrestling talk from the experts now. The world of MLW.